clear to everybody here that from my point of view, Dante is extremely important. And I, I think he is. I think he is the perfect person to study to understand how Western civilization has journeyed from the ancient world of the ancient Greeks and the ancient Jews all the way up to 1300, up to the year 1300. Now, the rest of our class, of course, will have to journey from 1300 to uh, 2000 and to today. But this part, this first part, is summarized, unified, brought together by Dante and by his, his ideas. But before we go forward, let's just look back. Let's just remember where we've been in our previous weeks. So remember, Eleanor. Why was Eleanor so important? Because, as you know, she led the whole culture of the 12th century, the world of courtly love, the world of the Crusades, the world of religious reform, uh, the world of the Cathar heresy, a new world of philosophy, and, of course, she leads the world of England and Henry II and her Angevin Empire. And then, in addition, she leads us to courtly love. We, we, we know because of her and her court and her life that she helped create courtly love. She was a close friend of some of the poets, and therefore she helped lead us to an understanding of courtly love. And then we have turned to Abelard and Eloise, the philosopher. Beginning of European philosophy in the Middle Ages is seen in the person of Abelard, Abelard the teacher, Abelard the philosopher, Abelard in Paris and on the left bank of Paris teaching those students there. Do they look happy? Do those students look happy there? I think they, I think they do. We've been talking about south of France, courtly love, crusades, philosophy, Abelard, and of course Abelard and Eloise and their incredible story um, of their love affair. Now, what happens between the 1100s and the 1200s to me move Italy into the middle of things? Let's just look here at Florence and we imagine this city in 1300. We can understand that it is like the story of Dante himself, the beginning of a great period, a very, very great period for this particular city. And one way we know it is, if we look at this picture of the city of Florence today, and if you look at those colors, those help you distinguish the different neighborhoods. And if we look at the center quadrangle there, the central grid, uh, that's Roman Florence. So you see how tiny Roman Florence was? Little, little tiny square. And the cathedral is just up there in the right corner. Now, the purple expansion of Florence, the green and the purple, that's medieval Florence. And medieval Florence would be a wall running all the way up the uh, northwest side at a diagonal and up the northeast side at a diagonal. That's the expansion of Florence from Roman Florence to the Florence of Dante. Now, you can all see that the expansion of Florence from Roman Florence to Dante's Florence is like five times as big, five, six, seven, eight times as big. And that just tells you everything that you need to know about the role of Florence in 1300. Something extraordinary is happening. Something extraordinary is going on. If we go back to the, to the Roman city, there's the square. You see the grid right in the middle of the map there? That's Roman Florence. Uh, Florence is founded in the age of Julius Caesar. So around 55 BC, it's very small. It's just by the river. It's not a big city. It's not very important. Uh, and it's a place to cross the river. And the most important thing about it is there's a place to cross the river. So the bridge that is the Ponte Vecchio today was a Roman bridge, and it's 2,000 years old. It's been there ever since the Romans built it. The uh, basic foundation of the Ponte Vecchio is still the Roman, the Roman piers that are underwater. There's a model of Roman Florence, uh, which is just a square right there on the picture, as you can see. Uh, and those people are in a nice little museum in Florence that has models and, and paintings and decorations of, uh, of, uh, of, present, of, of the you know, historical evolution of Florence. 
Now, what happens with the fall of Rome? What happens to Italy and the Mediterranean world in the 400s, 450? If we want a date for the fall of Rome, we've already talked about it. You know that 476 is the last emperor in Rome in the continuous line all the way through. 476 is the last emperor uh, in office in Rome. And then after he leaves, he's just a boy. Uh, when he leaves, he gives up, he abdicates. There's, there are no more emperors. The, the emperors in the east, in Constantinople, of course, exist and are there. But in Italy, there's no emperor. So in the 400s, the late 400s and 500s, the peninsula is swept by chaos. And you can see on this map, all over Europe, people, huge numbers of people, hundreds of thousands of people are moving in these huge communities, even millions, into certain areas, new areas, and, and, and conquering and moving in and settling down. So you can see the Goths move into the southeast, and then they come to Italy, and then they go all the way to Spain. Uh, the um, Franks move into France. The Angles and the Saxons move in uh, to England. And so all these places go through this huge convulsion of invaders, attacks. Here's a wonderful painting in an early medieval manuscript of the king of the Goths, Totella, knocking down the wall of, Fran of Florence. How do you like that? How about that? Little, a little photograph of Totella knocking down the wall of Florence. There's the baptistry, and you can see he's knocking down the stones of the, of the Roman wall, the Roman wall that went around that little uh, grid pattern part of the city that we saw. Uh, so in the 500s, Florence is uh, seething with invaders and with huge numbers of people sweeping in, knocking down the wall, pushing people out, and, of course, confusion, uh, conf confusion, chaos. Here's a map of the Lombards, who are the next invaders in the late five and 600s, and they sweep down from the north. Who are the Lombards? Longobarba. Lombards had longo beards. Long Barba's beard, long beard is Barba, long Barba. So uh, they swept into Italy and set up a uh, Lombard kingdom in the north, which came to be known as Lombardy, probably some of you have been there, and all the way down to Florence, including Florence. And by 600, there's a whole new series of states. There's a new Gothic state in Spain. There's a new Frankish state in France. There's a new Lombard state in Italy. And then there's another series of invasions, which you will remember from our talk in the Dark Ages, which is the spread of Islam out of Arabia and into Egypt, west all the way to Spain, east all the way to Afghanistan. So in these years, 500, 600, 700, 800, uh, this part of the Mediterranean is ripped apart by invasions and by wars and by rumors of wars. And so uh, Italy is caught in the middle of chaos. And so Italy has about a 500-year period we talked about a few weeks ago, the Dark Ages, from 500 to 1,000, when Italy is not the center of reconstruction but is caught up in confusion, chaos, um, destruction, destruction of the walls, just as we saw in our picture. And then around 1,000, something happens, around 1,000. And the most important thing that happens is that Italians, um, particularly a group of Italian states around the coast of Italy, and all this is right about the year 1000, called the Maritime Republics because they're Genova on the coast, Genoa, Pisa, uh, uh, Amalfi down the south, Bari on the east, Ancona on the east, Venice on the east. These these maritime republics right on the coast, they get together and they begin to pacify the ocean, the, the Mediterranean around Italy. And they begin to create a new zone of peace around the peninsula. And as this happens, this has a positive effect on all the cities uh, of the peninsula, on trade, on roads, on all the things that are happening. And and in 1113, 1113, 
there's a huge crusade that's led by these city-states, led by Pisa, uh, to drive the Islamic navies and pirates out of the Mediterranean off the coast of Italy. So around the year 1100, Italy has begun to organize and create peace for the first time. And what you see there on the map next to our picture of Pisa is the result. The result is that as the Mediterranean becomes more peaceful and as trade and ships can uh, sail to the great Italian ports, then the goods that they're bringing, uh, spices from the east and valuable jewelry, all the different things, they can go into Italy in Venice or Genoa or Pisa and go over the mountains, those blue routes going over the Alps, and connect Italy to the rest of Europe. And at that moment, bang, at around the year 1100, suddenly Italy becomes the center of progress, of commerce, of trade, of new products, of new uh, higher protein diets, everything you can think of. Just make a list of the good things that can happen. And it's all happening around the year 1100. And it's just simply because those city-states got together, cleared out the pirates, opened up the Mediterranean to peace. And the symbol of all of this in Florence is that building. That's the symbol of all of this for Florence. For Florence, that building is being newly rebuilt in the beautiful uh, stone marble that you see right there in front of you, the new baptistry. And that baptistry, that building, that project is the center of a whole list of um, things happening. Number one, there's a pope who comes from Florence. He's, he's, the, he's the Archbishop of Florence, and he becomes Pope Nicholas uh, in the 1050s. There's another pope, Gregory VII. He's from Tuscany. He also has lived in Florence. He becomes a pope, too, in the, in the 1080s, and he also believes the importance of Florence. And then there's a third person you see there in your picture, Matilda of Tuscany, the great Contessa of, of Tuscany. And she moves to Florence and lives in a palace right next to the baptistry. And so by all of these steps, by all of these moves from, say, 1,000 to 1,200, so in those 200 years, Florence becomes more and more and more important in the peninsula and more and more important in Italy and more and more important in the Mediterranean. And so as we move back to our man, Dante, the man in the middle, we come back to this extraordinarily creative moment when uh, Florence is a leader in Tuscany, Florence is a leader in Italy, Italy is a leader in Europe. Mm -hmm.